Thank you. Well, welcome to those of you that are joining us uh, online this morning. Thank you for being with us today. It's always cool to be able to have people out there online with us watching and being a part of what we're doing here. And thank you for doing that. Also, those of you that are newcomers, this may be your first, second, or third time here with us today. Thank you for being here and choosing Southgate as your place of worship this morning. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause and thank them for being here. <clears throat> and if you are a, a newcomer and you've never got a first time or a second time gift, please come back to the covered patio area immediately following service today. And we do have a gift to give to you just to say thank you for being with us. And if you have been here for a third time, this is your third time here with us. We have a special gift we'd like to mail to you. And uh, how you get that is just taking the uh, card, the communication card, right in the seat back that's right in front of you there. Fill that out, drop it in the tithe box that you'll see that's hanging on the wall out in the entryway. And uh, put your name and address on there and then just put third time over in the corner. And we'll make sure we mail that to you. And also um, what that will do is it'll just add you to our weekly email that we send out just to inform people of what's going on. If you would like that, that would be fine. Um, we don't sell your name to a mailing list or do anything like that. It's just for us in-house to communicate with you and let you know what's going on. So if you would like to be a part of that, just drop that card in the tithe box on your way out. And that is one thing here that we do differently, is that we don't take up an offering in a traditional way with ushers and passing a plate. We actually have a tithe box in the entryway, and the reason we do that is because that's our way that we just believe that God has told us to do this. We do what we do here because of you. We, we, this whole thing, all we do here at Southgate, all of our missions that we support around the world, everything we do here is all done by the giving of the people right here in this place. That's, right. That's you. So if you have been a part of Southgate and uh, you have not be begun that process of contributing here, I encourage you to do that. That's, that's how the kingdom of God flourishes on the earth. That's how this happens. God doesn't drop money from heaven. I wish he did, but he drops money from heaven through you. He does it through you. And that is how you and I participate in God's plan on the earth is through our giving. We, we, do, we do here uh, through that way. So I encourage you to jump in, be involved with us. Also, if, you, if you're getting like big bonuses at the end of the year and you don't, just don't have any place to put them, um, <clears throat> Drop them right here because that will help us make sure that we come to the end of the year in a positive way and start off the new year fresh. Um, yeah, and let us know. I mean, maybe you want to take some of that money and contribute to an area of ministry here. That's great. We've had people that say, hey, I want to give, I want to give, you know, my this year's tithe bonus to my, to the youth group or whatever. We have bought sound equipment because of people's generosity. We have done all kinds of things here um, just because people want to be able to do that. You know, one thing is fun um, when, when we hear stories, and I appreciate Sharon and uh, Donnie's story. How many of you were here when they showed, shared their testimony about what God did for them? And, and uh, I encourage you, if you did not hear that, go back and check that out on one of our past services. That was last, let's see, Last, no, two weeks ago. No, it was last week. Yeah, last week. Everything goes by so quick. But go back and check that out and hear their story and their testimony of what God did when they said, okay, God, we're going to start tithing. God just, bang, showed up, and it was so super cool. But, you know, it happens all the time. It's just, you know, how God takes care of us, and we do what we do. So thank you for doing that. Also, if you real quick grab your... Uh, bulletin there. There is some information there. Just wanted to let you know if you're involved in ushering, greeting, uh, safety team, any of those. We have a, about a 20-minute meeting right after church um, that we just want to go over some stuff in the new year. And where are we going to do that, Tina? Is it in here? Yeah, right here. So just come back in here. Um, give about 10 minutes after service and then come on in here and we'll get rolling and get you out of here. Um, also, the women's cookie basket party, that is next Saturday. Our women's ministry put together some really cool uh, baked goods and stuff for Christmas gifts. If you would like to be involved in that, please contact Tina. We'll 
Uh, you can contact Tina. Tina, raise your hand back there so everybody knows who Tina is. All right. And um, volunteer gifts. If you have served here at Southgate in any way, we have a Christmas gift for you. We just put together some, you know, just a way of us showing our appreciation to you. And there are some volunteer Christmas gifts for you back on the back table there. So please go back and get that. It's just to let you know how much we appreciate you. So thank you. Thank you, thank you for doing that. Merry Christmas to everybody. Welcome, it's good to see you. I love you all. You guys are special people. It's my privilege to be able to serve you. So thank you for being here with us this morning. This morning, my message is titled, All I Want for Christmas. All I Want for Christmas. Every year during the Christmas season, the quintessential question we all get asked is what do you want for Christmas? How many of you have been asked that? How many of you have been asked that? What do you want for Christmas? I don't know about you, but it's hard for me um, to answer that question. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe it's because I always think, well, you shouldn't be spending your money on me. Go spend it somewhere else. And then I always realize, well, maybe it's because I'm just indecisive. I can't, I can't decide what it is I want. I'm jealous of those people who when you ask them the question what they want for Christmas, they pull out the list. <clears throat> they have already written their list, and they know what it is, and it's all listed out by priority um, and expense. You know, so, I mean, God bless you if you're one of those list people. I'm jealous that you know what you want. So before we get too far uh, in the message today, I'm curious as to what type of gift people we have um, in this room this morning. So generally people, when they, what gifts they like, fall into different kind of categories. We first kind of have the toy gift people. So that means that you're the type person that at Christmas time you like to get toys. So when you were a kid you got toys as an adult, you know, adult guys now, our toys have moved from, you know, cars and trucks to chainsaws and, you know, stuff like that. If you're a toy gift person, raise your hand. If you like toys for Christmas, <clears throat> like toys, some of you just want a truck for Christmas. Yeah, there you, there you go. You have the toy gift people. You know what's amazing? One year, I remember this, one year the Rubik's Cube was like the biggest Christmas sale item in the world. And I thought, what kind of people want a Rubik's Cube? I want something fun for Christmas. I don't want to have to work my brain. I mean, who, yeah, did you, did you do the Rubik's Cube? Who's a Rubik's Cube person? I'm not even going there. I still haven't figured that thing out. Anybody with me in that? How many of you have not figured out the Rubik's Cube? Yeah, see, there you go. All right. Next thing is clothing people. Clothing. How many of you like clothing? Clothing for Christmas. Okay, there you go. We got, we got clothing people. Then you got shoe people. How many shoe people do we got? Because you got to understand now, look, shoes are not clothing. Shoes are a completely different category. Tina, we found out this morning, has over 200 <laughs> shoes. And Tim nodded his head and said, yes, because I have no room in my closet at all. It's shoes. Jerry likes shoes. I know. Right here, huh, Jerry? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. You got the, the shoe people. Then, of course, you've got the cash people. There, there we go. Who's a cash person? See, I'm kind of a cash person, and not because of any other reason than I think that's easy for people. I do. I go, well, you know, if you, just, if some, if you really want to do something, cash is fine. Because then I think, well, they don't have to go shopping. They just, here you go. Then it helps them realize, okay, I was nice and I gave them some. Here's some money. You know, but cash. So if you're going to give me cash, usually it's somewhere around 10, 12, 15,000 is good. <laughs> <coughs> that, that covers it. No, but you have, you have the cash people. Isn't that interesting? Everybody kind of breaks up into different categories. And then it, when it comes to Christmas shopping, you have people who have been shopping all year. 
that have been preparing for Christmas all year long. Then you have people that start right after Thanksgiving, that it used to be called Black Friday. Now it's like Black Month or, or something. There's no Friday involved in it. Then you have those people who wait until Christmas Eve. Any Christmas Eve shoppers in here? Because usually Christmas Eve shoppers wait until the last minute, and the reason is they go, they have to go through their money and go, okay, I'm going to make sure I got what I need. So Christmas Eve. So what I did this morning is I put together some last-minute options for you um, that I'm going to give you some hints, some ideas of last-minute ideas that you can go out shopping for your spouse, your kids, your wife, husband, whatever it is um, this morning. So if you just need some ideas of what you should go, go for, we'll start off. So if you're looking for something for your wife, you can go with the sweater that Mrs. Claus, I'm Mrs. Claus, but I'm married to the Grinch sweater. And then in the first service, we had somebody shout out, that's my husband. No, I'm kidding. They really did. No. And then you have the one for your friend <clears throat> or another family member, the toilet timer. That's always a very perfect gift for maybe somebody at your work that you just want to give something to. Maybe you're for your dad or your father or your husband. You can get them this one right here, the best farter ever. Oops, I meant my father. <clears throat> Well, you know, I'm just trying to give you some ideas. For those that have pets, those that have pets, these are some really awesome items. You've got the pet butler. That will help for you if you have like a Christmas party, people are coming over, you want somebody to carry around like the, you know, hors d'oeuvres and stuff, you just put it on your dog. He can walk around. They also have one for cats. I don't know how well that would work out. Yes. And then um, when you don't have time to sweep, you have the pet sweeper. Yeah, you have the pet sweeper. So you just put it on them while you're doing your cooking. They can walk around and clean your kitchen for your whatever it is. I um, mean, then if you don't have time to clean up after your dog, you know people are going to be in your backyard. <clears throat> you have hide a poo, and it comes in an eight pack. So if you go in somebody's backyard and you see it filled up full of rocks, you'll know. You'll know what's going on. Maybe you still haven't decided, maybe you're a first time parent and you have young children or your grandparent and you haven't decided what you want to get your young kids, your grandkid, you always have the My First Fire Starter Kit <laughs> that you could get. Yeah, the My First Fire Starter Kit that can help move them along in their career choice, help give them an idea of what they want to do from their... Look, it even comes with an 8-ounce fuel can. <laughs> and the poker is a really good item for two years and above. Two years and above, yeah. You give them a poker that they can walk around with. And last but not least, the gift that will fit everybody's budget and will work for anybody on your Christmas list, the Bob Ross Toaster. So you can serve Bob Ross for for breakfast or whatever, you can get a face of Bob Ross on your toast. Bob Ross. There you go. There's some good ideas that you guys have for, for Christmas right there. You know, if we ask the great theologian, uh, Mariah Carey, <clears throat> what she would want for Christmas, who knows what her answer would be? You. Hey, you guys are awesome. You guys are flowing along right with me this morning. Did you know since 1994, when she co-wrote this song, the average royalties on that song are $3 million a year. As of right now, they have earned $75 million from the royalties of that song. 
Isn't that crazy? This is why I keep telling my daughter Andrea, write, write, write songs. <laughs> you never know. You never know, right? Well, I want you to know that it's okay, that it is okay to have once for Christmas, and it's okay to get stuff for Christmas. Most of us, even though most of us will probably forget what we got for Christmas this year when it gets to next year, but it's okay to have something, get something for Christmas. Why? Because Christmas is giving. Christmas is about giving. If you ask most people outside the church what Christmas is all about, they will generally say something about giving, or it's a time to be loving to other people, doing something good for someone else. Christmas season, I think we would all agree, does something to people's heart about giving. It just creates it. Now, if you ask church people, those that have been around the church long enough, what the real reason for the Christmas season is, most people are trained to say what? Jesus is the reason for the season. Right? We, we generally all respond with Jesus is the reason for the season. And you know, I got to thinking about that. I got to thinking about the question, what do you want for Christmas? That we all get asked. And then I got to thinking about a different question. And I want to propose to you this morning that I think there's a more important question that we should ask. A question that is more focused verbal, ver vertically than horizontally. A question to God instead of each other. And the question would be, God, what do you want? What do you want for Christmas? I know that's kind of crazy to think about. What would you get God for Christmas? You know, we focus a lot of attention on what we want, which is not bad. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I wonder how much attention we focus on what God wants. God, what do you want for Christmas? What would God want for Christmas? I mean, talk about somebody who has everything. There, there's really, what are you going to get God that he hasn't seen or, or, you know, been a part of for all of these years? What could we possibly give to God that would bring any satisfaction or joy to the infinite, eternal, almighty creator of the universe? What could you possibly give God? See, think about it. The Bible says that God holds the world in his hands. And he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. So basically he owns everything and he has everything. What could you give to God? You know, many of us know the what of Christmas, but do we know the why? See, we do know the what, but do we know the why? We know the story of Jesus. We know about the shepherds. Mary and Joseph, the wise men, but do you know why? You know, it's interesting, even people who are not church people generally know the story of Christmas. One way or another, they may not know all the intricate details of all the story, but they know it's about Jesus. They know they've heard about the wise men. They've heard about many of these type things, but the real question is, do they really know the why? Of Christmas. Why did God the Father send his one and only Son to this planet in the form of a human being to live and die and conquer sin on our behalf? What is the reason for that? See, to me, the very simple reason and very simple answer to the question, the why, the why is you. The why is of Christmas is you. See, a lot of people miss the priority that's in God's heart through this season. We see the bumper stickers and all the signs that are all around that say Jesus is the reason for the season. But I propose this morning that it's not. That Jesus is not the reason for the season. Now don't take me wrong. Don't pick up you know, rocks and start throwing at me or run me out of here on a rail. I'm not meaning to be any disrespectful disrespect to Jesus at all, but I think when we look and we see the point of Christmas, 
that Jesus wasn't God's reason for it. The real reason for Christmas is you. See, I think the world, and I think you and I even, have allowed God's purpose for Christmas to slip. Not because we did it on purpose, because we love Jesus. And really it is His birthday, and we all love Him, and we all honor Him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and He and the story and all of that. But when you really look at what the Bible says... He's not the reason. See, if God wanted Christmas to be only about Jesus, then why was he born the way he was born in the place that he was born? Of course, it was prophesied, we know that, but God could have written the story differently, but he didn't. If it was all about Jesus, it would have been clear and clear to you and I that you better not give gifts to each other Because that's bad. That's real bad. Because it's not about you. It's about Jesus. But no, he wants us to share in that with each other. He he allows the spirit of Christmas that gives gifts and loves other people and shows love to humanity. He he allows that. Why? See, he didn't say not to do that. See, if Jesus would have come like one of the religious leaders in his time, he would have made it all about himself. We know the story of those religious leaders. Jesus even called them out. said that you guys stand in the marketplace in front of everybody. Make sure you're dressed in all of your right garb and pray your prayers loud enough and perfect enough so everybody can hear them. Jesus rebuked them for that. Why? Because all of this wasn't about him. It wasn't about him. He didn't do that. You and I, we've been around people who just can't stand not being the center of attention. How do we know? Because you know as soon as you're around them that everything they say or do is always focused on themselves. Somebody tells a story, they have a better one. If somebody did this, well, theirs was better. Because it's something about they just have to have the attention. Well, guess what? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus spent most of his career pushing the attention away from himself and he would say all I want you to do is glorify God and not me see he pushed everything away from himself Jesus was exactly the opposite he didn't want the attention he wanted to show love to you and I and he wanted you to see the respect that God had for you and he wanted to honor us and love us that's the big reason why Jesus said That he was the servant to all. He said, I'm a servant. This is not about me. It's about you. It's about humanity. So the question that we ask, what does God want for Christmas? I believe that what God wants for Christmas is you. I believe that what God wants for Christmas is the people out there that don't know who he is. He wants you and I to focus the attention on them this season. Yes, Jesus is important because without Jesus, the story would not be what the story is. We would have no hope. Jesus came to this world to bring us hope, but he did it to bring us hope and to bring the rest of humanity hope. See, God knows that I don't mean any disrespect or dishonor to Jesus this morning because I know that he is still the light of the world and he will be the light and the life of the world whether or not I say that he is or he isn't because he is who he is he is still the king of kings and the lord of lords he's made that he's proved that of himself but I do believe that what God wants us to do is focus on what the reason for the season really is and that's you and me I know it's hard for us to accept that It's hard for us to think about that. And really, that's good. Because it shows that you and I have the right heart. That we have the same heart that Jesus did. That he did not want it to be about himself. He wanted to reflect all the glory to God. And we are just like that. But at the same time, he wants you to know what's in his heart towards humanity. 
and why he did what he did. He wants you. He wants these people. That's what he's always wanted. That's what God wants each and every day. See, you and I are the ones who control that decision. God can get everything that he wants, but what he can't do is he can't supersede your free will. So when he has you and he has someone else, that means we've chosen on our own to allow God to present our life as our gift to him. We've done it freely. See, the one thing that God wants, 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 tells us this. See, it says, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all, everybody say all, all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You want to know what God wants for Christmas? There it is. He wants everyone to be saved. I think... In a funny sort of way, Mariah Carey's song is kind of prophetic, if you think about it. She probably never realized that when you think about all God wants for Christmas is you. That's really what God wants. We could almost sing that song to God, and God could sing that song to us. Did you know that God sings over you? See, most people don't realize that God sings. He sings. We know the angels sing. He created Lucifer, who was the most powerful, one of the most powerful angels in heaven, who was the worship leader of heaven. He created him with music inside. So we know God loves music. God created it. But most people don't realize that God sings. In Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17, it tells us, The Lord your God is among you. He is mighty to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God sings over you. Isn't that incredible? My prayer is that this year that when you hear that song, you will realize that God wants you. God wants you, when you read the Bible from cover to cover, there's no way that you can avoid seeing the redemptive plan of God for you and me. That's the center and the heart of the gospel, is to reach man. Have you ever heard the term, God is with us? That's a popular kind of term we hear this time of the year when we say that. I think many times we don't really understand what those words mean. Because it wasn't always like that. God was not always for every person. He was in his heart, but he couldn't show it because of the limitations of man's sin that was not dealt with until Jesus came to this world. See, when Jesus came to the earth, it fulfilled the prophecies of thousands of years ago. And one of those prophecies is found in Isaiah chapter 17. And it says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. That was written 700 years sometimes, 700 years before Jesus came. 700 years. This word is only used three times in the entire Bible. Two in the Old Testament, and one in the New Testament, that was spoken to Joseph, the non-biological father of Jesus, by an angel. In Matthew chapter 1 and 23, it says, Behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, to you and I, that term God with us is familiar. You've been around church long enough, you've heard it, and you've heard it, and you've heard it. But what you have to understand, people back in their day, when this word came to them, this was foreign to them. It was foreign to them. You want to know why? Because for 500 years, there was silence. There were no prophets in the land that they had used to. All they had were the old stories. Basically, God was silent 
in their years. Nothing was going on. They were having a hard time trying to figure out why are they being run by the Roman rule, by the Roman government. They're enslaved to the Roman government. All of this is going on. Where is God? So for them to hear God is with you, that God is going to come to you, He is going to have a Savior, they figured it was never going to happen. And all of a sudden, God now is going to show up and be there for them. Emmanuel means God with us. In the original language, it would have been pronounced this way, with us is God. With us is God. Because of the birth of Jesus Christ, not only is God with us, but He is now for us. God is with us, and He is for us. Romans chapter 8, and I'll read a portion of that, and the rest of it's written in your handout there. And it says this, the Apostle Paul says, What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us <clears throat> all things? See, God is for you. Look at your neighbor to say, and say this, God is for me. In Jesus Christ, God is with us, God is for us, and God is in us. God is with us, God is for us, and God is in us. The birth of Jesus answers two big questions. Is God with me, and is God for me? See, that is the same question that people had in the days of Jesus 2,000 years ago. Is God with me, and is God for me? God is with you, and God is for you, and He wants to be in you. Amen. Jesus' birth into this world was about you, and it was about me. He wanted you to see visibly that He is with us, and that He is for you. All of us battle with those two statements. We battle with those two statements all the time. We hear all this stuff in our mind that screams the reasons why. And there's no way that God is for me and God is with me. Well, don't you know, God, what I did? Don't you remember, God, this just happened a while back? I'm supposed to be a Christian. How can anything like that happen? You can't possibly be with me. Yeah, you're probably with Pastor John. Amen. You're probably with so-and-so, but you can't be with me because I'm me. I'm a problem. But God says, no, God is with you. And God is for you. See, we think that we're not worthy. We're not worthy to have God with us or to have God for us. And the reason we think that is because everything we think is all based on performance and it's all based on whether we're good enough or whether we've earned it or we deserve it but Jesus came and said that's why the angels pronounced to shepherds that I bring you good news for all people all people look at your neighbor and say all and that means your boss that you don't like that person that you work next to. Of course, that's not applicable to any of the employees here at Southgate. <clears throat> right? Right. They're all nodding. They're going, oh, no, we have the best boss ever. Yeah. <clears throat> See, Jesus came to make sure that you understood the reason for the season. You know, one of the meanings of Christmas is that God is with you and that He is for you, not because you deserved it or you earned it. That's grace. That's grace, and that's why we call it amazing. It's amazing because God just gives it to you, not because you earn it or deserve it. You just say yes to God, and He pours out His grace to you. Jesus came to make sure that you understood that. So as you leave today, I want to challenge you to realize that all God wants for Christmas is you. 
you can't give him any natural gifts, what are you going to give him? What he wants is you. And here's the beauty of it all. God is not waiting for you to shape up. He's not waiting for you to clean up. And he's not waiting for you to grow up. He loves you just the way that you are. He loves you because you are you. And there is no one else like you. Some, somebody would probably say, thank God. <clears throat> there is no one like you. So the true story of Christmas, to most people, really, though, is like a gift card they received as a gift and it never gets used. God has offered this gift to so many people, but <clears throat> it sits under their tree and never gets used. Give them that gift. Let them make that decision. See, if they choose to use it, that's up to them. If they choose not to, that's up to them. Did you, did you, I don't know if you realize this, but Americans right now are sitting on $15 billion of unused gift cards. 15 with a B. $15 billion of unused gift cards. So I had an idea. I'm going to start a website that says, send it out to everybody, that says, please send me your unused gift cards. <laughs> and I'm going to see how much many millions of dollars I can get an unused gift card. Just go through your gift cards and send them to me. Right? Wouldn't that be amazing? I just get piles and piles of gift cards. We just spread them out to all kinds of people all over the place. But you know what? That is what this is about. This whole story of Christmas is, is really a gift card to all kinds of people that sit under their tree and they never open it. See, you have right next to you today, you have an invite card. You have invite cards that are around there. Grab those cards and go give them to somebody. Invite them out for our Wednesday night candlelight communion service. Get them to come out. Did you know that more people during Christmas and Easter will actually go to church because a friend or a family member invited them than any other time during the year? They will come. The percentages are about 90%. If you invite them, they will come. Think about that. And some people go, oh, all you, they just show up twice a year. Well, I'm glad they do. And I'll tell you why. Because at least they're coming to church and they, that may be their year. That may be the moment in time when they make the decision. The light finally comes on in them. The real reason why they need to be consistently involved in a local body of believers. Why they need to read their Bible on a regular basis. They need to be born again. They need what God has to offer them. And that may be their year. You may be the very catalyst to bring somebody into the kingdom of God simply by handing them an invite card. Why? Because this whole season is about them. It's all about them. You know what? And I'm not saying we don't focus on Jesus. We don't appreciate what Jesus has done. But Jesus at the same time is saying, stop. Focus on these people that don't know who I am. Focus on them. Turn your love to them. Tell them, yeah, tell them about me, but I want them. I want them. So the whole point of Christmas is about God loving humanity and sacrificing himself for them because it was about us. It's not just about Jesus. It's about us. Amen? Amen. Well, Father, we thank you for reminding us how much you do love us. And we do thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he has done. And I thank you, Lord, that you are for us and you are with us. No matter what we do, no matter what we've done, you're always there with us and you're always there for us because you love us. So today, thank you for this reminder. Help us, Lord, to take what we know is true and reach out to other people who don't know the real reason for the season. Help us to go share with them. The real reason for the season is them. And what God came to do for them 
that they could develop a relationship with you. And we give you praise for this today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Don't forget, uh, all those of you involved, ushers, greeters, and all that, we'll be back here in just a few minutes. And just don't forget also, if you're a volunteer, please go back to the table and grab your appreciation gift for being involved in what we do. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.